Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Set episode 273, uh, featuring the third installment of my interview with Miss Susan Manley of Old School. In this part of the interview, we talk about the 3DO console, uh, what it was like at uh, Electronic Arts during the uh, development and release and, and uh, debacle uh, of this console. It's a really interesting story. I know you're going to enjoy that. Uh, we also talk about uh, some just some basic uh, production management issues. You know, how do you know when's the best time to cut a project off? And then uh, we talk about the uh, Mutant League football game and, and much, much more, including uh, some stuff about Mode 7. A lot of great stuff here. Uh, so without further ado, here is Miss Susan Manley. So you also had some input on the 3DO console. I know that console <laughs> seems to have a cult following uh, nowadays. Uh, so you didn't think it had enough RAM, is that the, <laughs> what it amounts to? It, that was not my consensus, that was the consensus that I got. I, I had the privilege of working with all of the engineers that were doing the internal development at EA, and we had our own little floor in our new building at uh, 1450 Fashion Island. We called it the fourth floor, and, and literally it was me and about 20 guys, and they were some of the brightest minds in games it was pretty fun to be up there anyhow at the time i was really intrigued that trip was trying to start this whole new game platform and that he was really pushing the graphics on the product and that he wanted to marry it to all of these other technologies he wanted it to be what basically the playstation and the and the um xbox have become today he envisioned all that and so I was asking my fellow developers, what do you think of this box? I was also looking at it, quite frankly, um, we had the offer, the ability to invest in the 3DO when stock became available. And I was trying to figure out, was this a good investment? And I said, well, obviously, just because trips in it, you know, it's going to sell. Um, how long it does in the long run, I don't really know, but, you know, it's going to sell. Anyhow, my fellow employees basically said that they thought it was cool. However, they thought that it was hampered because it didn't have enough memory. And the problem is for when you're showing full video at 32 frames per second so that you don't get any herky jerky, it, you have to have enough RAM on top of that to actually have interactivity, which means to be able to go off in any direction at the time. So either you can have a game and little movies, which is what was already being done on the Sega um, CD system, or you had to have a really beefy system. And um, Trip actually had a, a big meeting where he invited all of the development teams from Electronic Arts into a big room to present us with what was inside of the 3DO. And he had handed out the technical documentation before that for everybody to look at it. And he went through basically his entire grand vision of what he hoped it would do and what he was doing about the business plan and all these other really cool things. Um, so he got to the end of his presentation and he asked, does anybody have any questions? And no one raised a hand. Now, Tripp is an amazing leader and he's a very vocal person. And I think that a lot of people didn't want to say, hi, your baby has warts, you know, <laughs> because they didn't want to feel pinned in that argument. Um, and they probably hadn't really talked about amongst themselves all that much either about it yet. Anyhow, I knew that a lot of people really did think that there was an issue. So I raised my hand and I asked Tripp, I said, Tripp, who helped you design this? And he said, well, Luke Bartolet had. And I said, and he said, why? And I said, well, I think the general consensus is, is that it doesn't have enough memory. And I explained what I meant by that. And he turned and he looked at the crowd and he said, who agrees with Susan? And 
the entire crowd raised <laughs> their hands. Yeah. And so I had opened up the can of worms and he got like, the, you could just tell he just started sweating on stage. And I felt really bad. I know that he had just come back from Japan to actually sell this in to all of the Japanese partners to manufacture. And he had a price point in mind for manufacturing and what needed to be inside the box. And all of a sudden he was finding out that he needed to have more memory. So you think that's what led to its demise? I think that that led to the Japanese not being as enthusiastic. Um, but I don't know for sure. I don't know all the politics. I do know that that was a pivotal time in, you know, pre the game system being there. We didn't have a prototype yet, you know. They were still working all that out. Um, this was all still on the drawing board, and we were starting to make software um, tools for it. But we didn't really know how important it would be. And actually, I remember how excited the executive team was when they came fa back from their first um, E3. And the, the 3DO had been shown because they, the, they got a lot of positive response. And they came back and threw a lot of cash into development for the 3DO team, which was awesome. Um, the 3DO team was a separate team from the team that I worked with, by the way. So they were all headed under uh, Lucy Bradshaw, actually, um, was running that development team. So we were only loosely um, aware of what was going on over there. We were working on all of the big console stuff that was making all the big cash cow to fund all of that. So i got a project management question for you. Okay. So, you know, I've had some people on the show before. Uh, Robert Serotech, I don't know if you know him. No. He was on a while ago, and we were talking about how they were sinking all this money into this, you know, Australian branch. They, uh, The guys just never came through with the product. You know, they just kept asking for more time, more resources. Now, kind of wondering, you know, you know, from your point of view, how do you know, like, okay, it's time to pull the plug on this, or, you know, okay, I'm going to go ahead and give them another six months, or, you know, how does, how does it all work? Okay. There's a couple of different things. Um, you have to develop a schedule that allows you to monitor progress, which means what, do you, what can you see, what can you do, what's noticeable at every point in time. Some of it is going to be underneath the surface. It's an iceberg. Um, with the engineering stuff, yeah, it can be really difficult because when they're still putting together the things that are going to make the display engine or whatever else, only another engineer can go in and look and see that it's being put together. Um, the other thing that goes on is a lot of tasks, um, unless they've been done before by that particular team, they don't really necessarily know how long they're going to take and they might need guidance on how to do them. Um, so there's a couple of factors that come into play. If it's a new team working together for the first time and they're working on a new platform, it takes time for them to gel with each other and to gel with the platform. And so there are slip issues, definitely. And everybody's going to make things in their best guess. We never schedule tasks that are less than two days or longer than two weeks. And tasks should be defined so that you can tell when they are done. And we need to make sure that um, with art tasks, in order to truly be done, a, a, an art piece needs to all ready be all the way through the process and ready to actually put in the game there's a lot of art processing that's done after things are drawn that people will tend to forget and um i've actually seen that be a really big gating issue all of a sudden there's an engineer off doing a whole bunch of art processing <laughs> right before alpha <laughs> instead of actually doing the code the only thing that he can you know the thing that he can only do and so um, yeah, I used to do a lot of process management, which was no, 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 no. You know, you don't have your engineer processing your art. You can have an assistant producer processing your art. You don't even necessarily have to have an artist processing the art unless you need an artist to review it after it's done, if there's something that might be changed. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about all of that that really can pull in the amount of time that it takes to get something done. Um, by applying the, the right level of expertise or the right person. So what do you think was the biggest fiasco <laughs> during your time there? Really? 
biggest fiasco at electronic arts oh my goodness um as i sit here and try and think um i saw a lot of cash get waste ob wasted obviously on bard's tale and i think that part of it was that we just didn't know how internally to make a product of that size and scope they were trying to um, emulate what they were doing down at ssi in a grander scale and without people that had ever been through the process except for me and i had only been through it from an art point of view at the time so i wasn't able to help enough and that's why i pulled in victor because <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't an expert on the game mechanics and how they should go together i was i just knew that artistically things were not lining up um so we yeah we flushed a million dollars down the toilet on that product i'd say that was pretty big um other big gaffes um i can't think of any others that were really huge uh i'd say that um, one thing that Electronic Arts did do is it put a lot of monitoring in place in general to make sure that things were moving along and had regular check-in periods and people needed to get together and review what was going on. And I, you know, that was my whole job there was literally weekly you had to come and to the confessional and, <laughs> and confess your sins and ask to be absolved and move forward. No, it, basically... We, I, I ran my project teams a lot differently, which was basically to allow people to um, explain where they were at, what they needed to do, and what, a, what any problems that they had. So we were able to offload work or bring in expertise to approach things differently if we were having problems. And it really helped. I also helped a lot of the teams talk to each other. So it let's say they were making something specific to manage art in one particular product, we would make that tool available to other teams and they could modify it as needed for their products so that we were not repeating work all over the place. This was the land, by the way, the, the most interesting thing, especially based on today's um, development where a lot of people are working inside of other engines that are, everything's already defined. You know, you're working in Unreal, you're working in Unity. Every game engine in those days was made usually from the ground up. And although engineers all had their own individual tools, they pretty much were making things, you know, to spec for that individual product. And they were all one-offs. And so it was kind of the wild and woolly. You never knew exactly. I mean, when they were first doing 3D technology, you know, they were rewriting everything all from the ground up. So speaking of wild and woolly, <laughs> okay, you know, I was looking at just trying to wrap my head around. Uh, you know, they're doing games for Genesis, they're doing games for Super Nintendo, uh, Windows three point one, which doesn't exactly you know seem like a game, <laughs> a gamer, no. you know, a paradise there. <laughs> you know, no. and I've heard you know that it's kind of was especially with the uh, it can be kind of difficult working with the Japanese on these console games. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm kind of curious too about what it was like. Uh, targeting 3.1 windows um on 3.1 windows we were really lucky they brought in this windows genius who was a self-taught engineer his by the name of michael curry i still know michael today although he doesn't work on games anymore um and mike figured out how to make it work um he did things inside of windows that were, weren't supposed to be possible he still does that <laughs> um anyhow um I don't know any of the specifics about what challenges that they faced necessarily inside of all of that. Um, but I do know that, that he was able to make the product work. Um, the Working with the Japanese, um, actually, the biggest problem that we would always have is that uh, we would send things off to be final reviewed before the manufacturer. Um, and they would frequently find something that our test teams hadn't found um you know some extreme case of something that would cause a problem in the game so that you couldn't complete it and um 
one of the problems as products become more complex is that there are the possibilities that you know you you can get past a point in the game without collecting a particular item or having enough quite points or whatever that would trigger something else much later in the game and so they had to figure out they could they called them the snafus um, and the the designers and the producers were responsible for making sure that all of the different things always had to be accounted for. I noticed too that you had some uh, just a couple few last questions here. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I noticed that you uh, also had some input on these on some of these games, right? And that you were yeah talking about the ball cam in golf, which. Uh, you said that was inspired by David Letterman, so I had to look this up and see. You know, this, this, this chump on roller skates, that was something. Okay, yeah. Um, I was frequently walking in around all of the different cubes where all of the different engineers and artists worked, and um, I went back to deliver some schedules and some stuff to Michael Kasaka, and he was sitting in a cube with David Bunch, and they were playing some game on the Super Nintendo, which I hadn't seen the Super Nintendo prior to this. Um, but this game had come out of Japan, and I don't know the name of the game, but I do know that it went into Mode 7, which is the scaling graphics mode, and I had never seen anything like that. And it was some sort of parachute game where you parachuted out of planes, and then it went into Mode 7 to show these things scaling as they came towards the ground. And I was, as as an artist, I was absolutely flabbergasted. How were they doing that? You know, never seen anything like that before. So I talked to Michael about it, and he explained it. So I was really intrigued. And Michael was working on the Super Nintendo version of Golf at the time. And I said, well, gosh. I said, you're going to have to do a ball cam. And he just looked at me like I was green, you know. And... At the time, I was inspired because David Letterman used to do all these really wild things with cameras on his show. Late at, on, uh, if anybody's watched Late Night with David Letterman, you know, he, in the old days, one of the favorite things that they used to do is take things up to the top of a building and throw them off. And so they would throw watermelons and television sets and anything else that you would want to see go down 20 floors and explode. And they were doing this in New York City. So it was really funny. So then he started doing things with a camera and he had something called the monkey cam and they mounted a camera on the top of the head of a monkey and they had whatever the monkey saw. <laughs> and then they would put a camera on a person's head and fly it to the person through the audience above on wires. And they did all of these really strange things. And so you got this point of view that you would not normally get wasn't a fixed point of view it was a moving point of view and it was based on somebody or something in the room and so yeah that i it just hit me that you could do an actual ball cam on the game and be the ball and they did the ball they, the ball cam came into being after that now i don't know if michael had had that thought separately but i do know that i said that to him that's a really cool idea. I don't know any way, even with modern technology, they could actually put a camera in a ball you know, and replicate I, that experience. Well, certainly it wouldn't be steady cam because right. <laughs> the camera <laughs> wouldn't aim just forward. But yeah, it it really does add a lot to the game when you do those flyovers as the ball because you see the green approaching. You see all of the field as you're clearing it. It makes for a totally different experience. You also invented the pallet switch for the Mutant League football game? Yes, Mutant League football game. Um, we were, they were making that uh, an 8 megabit game. It was a small game. I don't think it was a 16 megabit. Anyhow, they wanted a lot of different play fields, and they were trying for these really far out different alien terrains. And... Um, the artist was having a hard time because they all had to fit in a very small amount of space graphically. And I, his name was Arthur Koch, by the way. And I suggested to Arthur that he try to define the character set so that he could have alternate palettes, which is, you know, the set of colors that um, you turned on and or off and create two different landscapes with them 
And he thought that was a really cool idea. And so off he went and did that. And basically what you can do is embed graphics in graphics and just with a simple palette switch, which is literally just a single pixel change, um, you can turn some, one picture on and another one off. And so he put the ice landscape underneath, I think it was like a moon landscape, I can't really remember at this time. Um, and so each one of those landscapes had slightly less colors, however they both were contained within the same set of characters and conserved space. So it allowed us to have more play fields in the game, which made the game a lot more interesting. Do you happen to follow his Kickstarter project to remake that? Oh, um, actually, I, I followed it for a little while, and then I kind of dropped off. I don't know what ended up happening. Um, I came up pretty far short. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. That's Michael Menheim, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's too bad. Um, I actually advertised it on my Facebook page. Um, Mendheim is an interesting character. He draws some really extreme, really cool um, comic book art that kind of, you know, is like it's inspired by that uh, rat fink type stuff from the 70s and the 60s. I, I really liked his art style. So I would have liked to have seen that game. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a fourth and final installment of this interview with Miss Susan Manley. So uh, stay tuned for that. A lot of great stuff coming up. As always, I want to thank you. Thank you very much from the absolute rock bottom of my heart for all of your support for Matt Chat. Really means a lot to me, guys. I uh, just had a great Google Air Hangout uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. A lot of good good times with you, with you guys. If you're having a, uh, done one of those Hangouts yet, uh, you know, just let me know if you want to participate. And I can actually invite you in and you can have your webcam on. Or if you just wanted to watch, uh, that that's cool too. Uh, but some really great discussions. Really having a good time with that. Uh, if you want to get access to those, uh, let's knock some stuff over. Ah, this enterprise keeps uh, getting in my way. Put him over there on the C64. Okay, uh, so if you guys would like to uh, participate in those, or I'm sorry, if you guys would like to support the show, I'll get it right here eventually, uh, just go to my link on the show notes to the Patreon site. And remember, uh, even a dollar uh, will get you access to all of that stuff. And I'm about uh, getting set to record my second uh, podcast as well. So uh, that's all just for the Patreon supporters so thank you very, very much yet again. All right, man, have I got some cool news this time. From the news from the Matt Cage segment. Uh, first up is this uh, epic Christmas gift. This is, uh, not to me, unfortunately, it's a, <laughs> to John Romero, rather, uh, who uh, is quite, de uh, quite deserving. Uh, this is the Icon of Sin sculpture. It's a, a Doom 2 uh, level uh, inspired uh, sculpture, I suppose. Um, sculptor name of Jason Height, and uh, Brenda gave this uh, to John uh, for Christmas. I mean, just look at that thing, and uh, <laughs> tell me you wouldn't want that in your living room, much to your wife and or husband's chagrin, no doubt. Uh, the second item, it's uh, really cool. Man, I'm just uh, <laughs> getting so envious. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Jason Broussard's uh, He's got a YouTube channel here, and I, I noticed this mention on, on uh, Kotaku. He's got a Sega Dreamcast kiosk retail display. He's completely uh, remade. It just looks fantastic. I mean, what a what a great site for uh, fans of the Dreamcast. I know a lot of you folks like that system, so <laughs> look on with lust. All right. Uh, that's it for the news. Let's see what we've got here for the uh, ale of the week. I've got a Claymore Scotch Ale we heavy. I uh, really begin again to these uh, scotch shells lately. I really like the uh, the flavor. I really like scotch too. I was just thinking I like scotch about as much as I do uh, ale, but the only <laughs> problem is, of course, uh, it doesn't take much scotch uh, to uh, render you into an ignoramus, whereas it takes a, a few more beers to reach that state. So I like to get stupider a little bit slower, if uh, that makes any sense. Uh, but anyway, the Scotch Ale, you kind of get the best of both worlds, right? A little bit of Scotch flavor, 
Although apparently, see, I thought the Scotch ales meant that they brewed it in some kind of bourbon casks or something like that, some kind of, maybe put in a little Scotch. Uh, actually, apparently that has nothing to do with it. It's uh, the way that they uh, brew it and the color of it, I believe, and the fact that it is a little stronger than a regular beer. See? <laughs> uh, so this is the Claymore Scotch ale, and you guys probably know what a Claymore is. That's uh, so they're joking around about. Uh, Unlike its namesake, this beer only requires one hand but it'll still make you feel like nobility. <laughs> what a nice sentiment. And there's suggested food pairings here. These are always fun. Uh, they can get pretty pretentious. Uh, braised pot roast, seared lamb chops, rosemary white beans. Come on. <laughs> if I'm gonna drink, if I'm gonna have any kind of fancy food with, a, with an ale, it's gonna be a big fat juicy steak. Maybe some shish kebabs. Uh, Great Divide Brewing Company, 7.7% alcohol by volume, so that is, it's on up there. Uh, let's see, where are these guys from? Denver, Colorado. Great minds drink alike. So anyway, I love uh, pretty much everything about this uh, so far. I love the, love the scotch, the ale, the claymore. Uh, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this claymore scotch ale. We heavy here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> you know the guy that makes these horns? Yeah, I actually offered to uh, decorate it for me for free, but I didn't really want to be away from my horn that long. I'd probably get like phantom horn syndrome from <laughs> not having this thing at my side. <sighs> this smells really good. You definitely smell the hops, kind of a cherry-like uh, flavor to this, I like aroma to this rather. Uh, this smells really good, a uh, really sweet smell, um, kind of chocolatey cherry sort of thing going, so uh, let's give it a taste. A uh, really nice flavor on this, a lot of toffee, coffee, chocolatey kind of flavors, a uh, real nice thick creamy uh, consistency to it, uh, no bitterness at all, kind of a little surprised, usually with a scotch ale, I would imagine a, a pretty uh, considerable uh, bitterness kick at the end, but Actually, quite smooth. Try it again. I mean, just just really, really tasty stuff here. It's uh, <laughs> this is really good. Just a maybe just a little bit of bitterness there, but uh, mostly what you're tasting are sort of coffee, chocolatey, toffee-like flavors. Uh, really, really good stuff. Uh, you don't taste the alcohol in this at all, even though it's a 7.7%, which is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, really, really good choice here. Another another winner, I think. I'm going to go uh, 5 out of 5. Drinking horns on the uh, Claymore Scotch Ale from the Great Divide Brewing Company, uh, Denver, Colorado. I guess maybe they got better water there in, in Denver, Colorado, <laughs> up in the mountains maybe. But anyway, very good choice. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I'll just uh, read this to you, and then I'll tell you uh, where it comes from at the end. Uh, I think you'll get a kick out of it. It goes something like this. Though we are few in number, and apart from the mainstream of the mass software marketplace, we are confident that both time and vision are on our side. Quotation there from a little upstart company called Electronic Arts. See you guys next week.